You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate and blockchain expert, Stefan DeBates. Now, Stefan is a Belgian investment, real estate, and hospitality entrepreneur. He is the founder and president of the international asset management firm, Elevated Returns, which controls the Aspen St. Regis Resort in Aspen, Colorado, and other commercial properties in the United States, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Now, Stefan is a pioneer in the blockchain-based real estate investing world. Through his firm, Elevated Returns, he facilitated the first major commercial real estate transaction using blockchain technology to sell ownership stakes in the Aspen St. Regis Resort, which we're going to be chatting about here today. And in February 2019, Elevated Returns announced plans to digitize its entire portfolio of real estate assets using the blockchain technology. And so, guys, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Stefan to the show. Stefan, how are you doing today? Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. It's going to be an amazing show. Really. And, and yeah, no, I'm excited to have you here. This is, um, you know, this is a point in time in the world where, you know, there's lots of disruptors and ultimately we're both in the commercial real estate space and the blockchain technology, while it's not widely adopted yet, I, I think uh, it's, it's really the future. And so, um, you know, excited to chat about this, this topic here today and, uh, and learn what you and your firm are doing actively in the space. And so before we dive into the, I guess, the meat and potatoes of it, uh, Stefan, if, if you could maybe you'll give a little bit more of a background of yourself, ultimately your experience and you'll fill in any blanks that I might have left. Okay, well, so you've done a great job, Kevin. So the, the short the short lifetime story is born and raised in Europe, migrated in the early 90s to Southeast Asia, was an institutional stockbroker then, came across the financial crisis in 1997, started basically acting as a restructuring specialist. And guess what? 90% of my restructuring loan portfolio was hotel. So fell in love with the sector, started becoming an investor, into the hospitality space. So the crisis in Lehman Brothers Bear Stern in 2007, and basically look at the similarities to, to what happened 10 years prior in Asia and say, that's the time to commit capital. So we bought the Synergies Aspen then, uh, that was a 2010 deal. And after that, we, we bought a couple of more uh, portfolio companies. But then what we realized along the way, we realized that the, the, the world of commercial uh, hospitality investing is really very incestuous. You have only a couple of players that really know each other, and it's a special investment club. Either you have the funds to buy a $300 million ticket item, that's very few people in the world, or you have to, to go through a read, and, and more, more that, that people believe a read is really a strategy more than an asset pool because you know what you have today, but you don't know what you're gonna to have tomorrow. So we kind of look and say, why is it that there is not a democratic way for people to buy a piece of the ownership that they, uh, of the asset that they, they love? If I go and stay every day, every year, in a particular hotel, maybe I want to be a shareholder of that hotel. So that's how we looked at it. We tried to do a single asset read listed on the NYC and the NASDAQ, but that failed. Uh, it failed for two reasons. A, the costs are prohibitive, and B, there's just no market in the traditional capital market for a small deal. So you have to be big or you don't, you don't succeed. So 2017 was the heydays of the ICO wave. So it really opened the eyes of many people towards blockchain. And similarly, we looked at it and said, hey, why don't we use a blockchain technology to allow transfer of private ownership in private companies? And that's how it started. We did a private placement for 20% of the hotel in October, 2018. We got those tokens listed on T0 last year. 
And I think that without realizing, we created a first transaction, which is now I'm being told, used as a case study in all major universities uh, around the globe. So, mm. exactly. Very interesting. So, I'd love to dissect a little bit the tokenization of those shares. You know, it, it help us better understand from a high level point of view, um, you know, w- what that actually means and, you know, how does that process take place? Right. Okay. So what it means for a consumer, it's actually you buying the true equity ownership into the hotel. So your rights are equal to everybody else. You have a right to cash flow. You actually own a piece of the hotel yourself. And because it's a tradable instrument, the beauty is you can actually buy more or sell some by connecting to uh, an alternative trading system, in this case, T0. Uh, What it means for the owner, it means that you can actually monetize a portion of your equity because typically in in the world of hotel ownership, it's a very binary world. You either own it or you don't. There is no concept of partial sale. And if you do a partial sale into a partnership, it's very cumbersome and it's illiquid for the partners. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the best of both worlds. It enables owner to monetize a portion of the equity and it enables consumer to actually uh, adopt or or build an exposure to the asset that they uh, cherish or not. So in the example of the St. Regis Resort, was that a situation where your firm was looking for some liquidity and ultimately this became one of the options on the table as far as uh, accessing that liquidity? Because, I mean, real estate's incredibly illiquid and uh, it seems as though you guys did a little test study, ultimately it worked out and uh, ended up tokenizing. Token zizing, right? I can't even say that. I know. It's so <laughs> That's funny. Uh, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Uh, the entirety of the shares of that of that asset. And so, um, uh, but was is, was that the primary reason for for uh, you know going that route was to get some liquidity out of that investment? I, I think it was both to to prove a point, as you okay. correctly said, to 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 build the basis of what an asset class could be looking like in the future, you always need a first. Mm-hmm. And the problem in being a first is you have great of great amount of tech people that create a business model on paper, but because nobody has ever done it before, it's very difficult to convince an owner to actually go for the exercise. On the other hand, you have owners that say, I could do with a bit of more liquidity, but I don't know the tech. So we were lucky enough to be on both sides so we could play with our own toy in order to prove a point. And it turned out to be extremely successful exercise. I mean, even though we had a pandemic, we've distributed over 12% of dividend on the asset in less than two and a half wow. years. The stock is up 25% on the IPO pricing. So I think that generally speaking, the people that have committed to to the coins are extremely happy. And and more and more, we receive phone calls from other owners and say, can you do another one for us? So I think that as much as 2020 was the year of DeFi in the blockchain world, I think 21, 22 will be the years of security tokens. And you're going to see many copycat deals because people want to gain exposure to real estate. I think everyone understands what the ugly face of inflation will do to our power purchasing power. And what is the best way to hedge that is own bricks and mortar. Yeah, absolutely. You hit on a couple of uh, important points I want to follow up on. Number one being, you know, the performance of this asset, this this case study we're speaking to, the St. Regis Hotel, um, did quite well even during the pandemic. As we know, a lot of people fled the the cities and uh, headed towards, you know, the mountains or the beaches or places where they had um, more room to roam and less restrictions in place. And uh, I know Colorado had a massive influx in a lot of the mountain towns, Aspen being one of them. What does that, you, you, you come from the hospitality background. I don't want to shift gears completely, but I would love to get your perspective on hospitality and the future of it. Not specifically, you know, a resort such as, a, you know, a niche resort such as the St. Regis in Aspen, but just generally speaking, what's your take or, you know, what's your crystal ball tell you on the coming years for hospitality as we kind of rebound in a post-COVID world? I think it would come back 
it's very simple. Humans are social animals. Mm -hmm. So it's great to do all those calls on Zoom, but at the end of the day, you want to connect with people. You want to share a joke at the bar. So, so I think result will do great, extremely great over the next two years. Uh, I believe that uh, international travel is probably a, a longer recovery. Uh, I think that what's going to happen, because the pandemic may be lingering from, for a couple of years, is each country will have their own rules. And I'm not too sure how international travel works having different rules and regulation Mm -hmm. in different countries. So I think that's more of a problem. I think hospitality would be a domestic affair for the next uh, 24 months at least. Uh, I think that the pain threshold on the big city is probably higher. But guess what? What you have when the hospitality world goes into crisis, you're going to have a constriction of new supply, Mm -hmm. which means that eventually the unbalance of demand supply will find a new equilibrium, and then you're going to have recovery. Yeah. I think that maybe the big convention hotel will have to find new ways to exist in the medium term. But guess what? You know, The brains in the hospitality industry are so creative that I have no doubt that three years from now, we will look back and say, this is a great... Uh, it was a great opportunity. Typically, hospitality as a global sector, it's a play on GDP growth. So if GDP does well, then hospitality will do well. Mm-hmm. There's a straight correlation there. Does your firm anticipate uh, some opportunities here in the, the next 24 months uh, as far as distressed uh, uh, purchases are concerned? I think that uh, everyone that I know has billions of dollars in their pocket burning a hole looking for this stress deal. But yeah. unfortunately, I don't see that there's going to be any distress assets for now because the banks are not putting the pressure on the owner. I think there is an ethical judgment saying you're not going to force somebody out in a pandemic. And therefore, the bid ask is way too wide. And this is why you can't really dream of buying a distress hotel right now. And if you could, that hotel would probably be distressed anyway five years from now. So it's probably not a good buy. Good, good point. Uh, switching back to blockchain, you know, you made a comment. You're speaking to the, you know, the case uh, case study here of the St. Regis Resort. Of uh, you guys were kind of on both sides of the of the table, and so you know, the one thing you didn't have to, the one challenge you didn't necessarily have to face was um, convincing yourself either as the owner or the investor as to why you should, um, you know, uh, kind of test this out, right? And, um, I, you know, do you anticipate that being one of the big hurdles um, as we evolve with this technology is, is the widespread adoption of it, right? Because you, you got commercial real estate in general, when you're talking from the owner's perspective, um, it's kind of antiquated, right? You got a lot of, you got a lot of low tech and it's, it's kind of making advance, it's making advancements, but it's, it seems to move very slow. And so do you see that being a, a, a challenge here over the coming years it is the, just again, the widespread adoption of this amazing technology? I, I think it is, it has been a challenge. I think people have talked about security token for the last three and a half years and they have not taken off. And, and the reason is because in the U.S., at least, they overregulate it. And I think that the Securities Exchange Commission is going to have to look at technological innovation like blockchain and find new ways to regulate, basically, this product. I think the 1933 Exchange Act is somewhat... It's going to need a, a bit of a revamp that's almost 100 years old. I mean, no surprise there. But But what we found out is... In the blockchain world, in the crypto world, you have all those people that are speculating on meme coins or whatever. Deep inside of them, they know that it's an accident waiting to happen. So if you can suddenly offer to the existing crypto community something that has more of an intrinsic value, but that has all the advantage of portability, easy buy, easy sell, I think you're going to see a migration of some of the profit of the people holding huge, huge stack of Ethereum, Bitcoin, to saying that should be better in the in the rainy days. Then what you're going to have, you're going to also have people like us that move to 
marketplace like Asia that have really clearly set regulatory framework to do public offering of, of real estate backed tokens. So with a public offering as opposed with a private placement, you have liquidity, which you don't have in the US. Mm -hmm. And I think that all what it takes is a few posts to deal that make the headline in the papers about increased size, increased liquidity, and then people fearing the really evil monster that inflation is and say, yeah. I can't buy a house. How do I get exposure to real estate so that I don't miss my purchasing power? And I think that the two together, which is migration of some of the crypto fluffy profit, regulatory framework in some part of the world, and the fear of inflation, I think it's a perfect storm to see the adoption of those security token accelerating in the next 24 months. Yeah, I think we're running that direction pretty quickly right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we were pricing the renovation of the hotel. We did it pre pandemic. Oh we were God. repricing the mother room. I think just on logistic and furniture and material, we're looking at 35% increase. Wow. Then we add up the contractor, the lack of labor. I mean, the Fed is saying trans, uh, inflation is transitory. I think hyperinflation is going to make damage and uh, I'm scared of it. So I try to protect my wealth. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, we're speaking to, you know, just one small component of where, you know, this blockchain technology will really play a major role in the real estate world. Again, this is a real estate podcast, so we'll, we'll stick to real estate today. And right now we're just talking about, you know, fractionalizing the ownership Correct. and using that St. Regis case study. What are some of the other ways that you see um, blockchain uh, being used in just day-to-day -day transactions? And, you know, from, from A to Z, you know, the, the beginning of the process to the end of the process of a transaction. I mean, is it, uh, are there many other uses for it? Well, I mean, yeah, there's limitless uses, you know, I always, people always come to me and say, why do it as a security token and not as a traditional read? And my answer has always been because you've got everything you would have in a read and everything more that we can't even dream about. Take, for instance, Steve Jobs. When he invented the App Store, he didn't think about what kind of application would sit on the App Store. He said, I'm creating a marketplace for other to innovate and invent on. I can give you a couple of examples of what's already in yeah. baked in. For instance, if you own Aspen coins in certain bracket of ownership, you get cash back when you stay on property. How cool it is. I'm an owner. I stay on property. And depending on the level of ownership you have, you've got a wire back, which is effectively a dividend in kind. So that's the kind of thing we've already built into the perks of ownership. Mm -hmm. I think that in the future, we are looking to launch new product, which is going to be more based on the utility function of ownership. In other words, what if you could buy the right to a room right, a room night in the future at a fixed price? I think this is where you're going to basically hit the mass adoption because mm. you go more and more disintermediated into the into the financial food chain. Yeah. But you know, you need to walk before you run. So one step at a time. On well, that fractional ownership model, what what's the secondary market for those that, that want to sell off their, you know, their fractional piece? Well, it's so it's still it's still early stage. So liquidity, it's not don't expect millions of dollars uh, trading every day. But you need also to remember that the total size, the market cap of the offering, is is about uh, is about twenty two, twenty three million. So it's a small offering, but it trades every day on T zero. Uh, or what you have to do is to open an account and uh, fund your account, and in two clicks you own share in the property. Uh, that you've selected. Uh, so the price has been surprisingly extremely stable, uh, which shows that there's probably both demand and supply. <laughs> and and uh, I think it's good, you know, I don't, I was, I was worried about seeing too much volatility into the issue, but you know, in fact, it has been extremely stable 
which shows to people that you can own something that's going to appreciate gradually over time. And it's not a hype where you may, you may make 3x in two days, but lose 75% yeah. of your asset in, in a week. So It's been an interesting last 12 months, that's for sure, <laughs> to say the least. So mm -hmm. elevated returns. Talk to me about you know what kind of projects you guys have going on today. I know before we started recording, you've got some exciting things um, here on the hook. And so please, please uh, share that with the listeners, if you would. Yeah, so so when we did the when we do the S Pen transaction here, we realized that the US regulatory environment is probably not the most progressive in order to uh, to uh, pioneer the digital asset place. I've spent 20 years of my life in Thailand, so I basically went and and talked with the regulator over there and said, What's your view on digital assets? And and the Asian countries see this as a way to accelerate basically their grasp on the capital market. So they actually mm -hmm. promote innovation. So what we did, we bought a 25% stake into a listed company, which was a traditional broker dealer company. Uh, the name now is Xpring Capital. The ticker is xpg.bk. It trades on the Thailand Stock Exchange. And what we've done for the last two years, we've acquired all digital asset license available, which means private exchange, issuance portal, secondary market, broker dealer, asset management, uh, lending. And we've built the pipe of what we think is necessary for the security token industry to be successful. Uh, the timing of the show couldn't be better because we will announce next week that our filing for an $80 million public offering real estate backed token is under review by the Securities Exchange Commission. We expect the review to be positive and uh, for the token to be on sale at the end of the month of June. And I think that would be the first regulated public offering without restriction of an asset-backed security token with immediate listing on a private exchange. That's exciting. That's incredibly exciting. So. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the U.S. then. What are some of the regulatory risks associated here in the U.S. Um, with basically anything that has to relate to this technology? I mean, what are some of the downsides or potential downsides that you see? I don't think there is. I don't think that there is a risk okay. when it comes to security token. The only risk is not to follow regulation. The problem is regulation is slow, expensive, and cumbersome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but true, so, so what's happening is because filing is so expensive and there is no differentiation between doing a $50 million deal or doing a $10 billion IPO, right. the small guys are not incentivized mm -hmm. to do a deal. So everybody recalls to the exemption, which is effectively doing private placement to accredited investor. Right. I think that's what needs to change. I, if, if the federal government is okay with people going to Las Vegas and gamble on red and black, maybe they should take a view that it's not as evil to own a share in a hotel deal and there should be a window of accelerated a regulatory review of those deals. I think that's ultimately what's going to happen. So let's talk about that. The, the year is, let's call it, the year is 2031. So 10 years down the road and you're reflecting back on, you know, and I guess speaking to the, to, to the U S um, you know, how, how the world generally speaking has changed. The real estate world has changed. Uh, the securities world has changed. Um, you know, more specifically how transactions are handled. You know, do you see that in 10 years? Is that, is that enough span of a time frame for, this technology to truly be widely accepted and those regulations uh, um, you know, modified to appropriately adopt to, again, this, this new form of doing business? Yeah, I think the fast forward prediction from elevated return type of think tank box is only criminal will be using fiat money. Everybody else will use smart money. That's number one. Number two, funding, lending will be completely disintermediated, which means small people like you and I would be funding big deals and the role of a, of a bank will be completely changed. 
I think the banks that are not seeing this will be obsolete and won't exist mm -hmm. five years from now. And, and thirdly, I think that everything will be in a digital form because what you have today, you just have the same kind of innovation that has moved communication from being in a fax to an email. So you're not talking about reinventing something that wasn't making sense in the future. You're just saying applying technology so that you make it cheaper, faster, and more accessible yeah. to, to consumers. So it is not an if. Is at what speed we're going to go there? Is it five years, seven years, 10 years? But I'm super hopeful because when you look at gentlemen like Gary Gensler, mm -hmm. now in charge of the SEC, if someone understands cryptography, and what it does in the world of securities is the man. So when I saw the appointment of, of Gary, I was super bullish on the future of this space. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Stefan, again, you've got a lot of great things going on. Um, what's the best place for folks that are listening to either learn more about you know, your firm, uh, learn more about updates as, as you guys move forward in this, uh, in this space, or just generally speaking, want to reach out and, and make contact with your group? What, what's the best place to find you? Well, I mean, we're very, we're very uh, private, but my Twitter, Stefan, at Stefan Debates, is probably the best place. Okay. In terms of public announcement, uh, we're just rebranding our investment portfolio in town and X Spring Capital. If you guys Google those words in the next couple of weeks, you're going to see lots of exciting announcement being made. So X Spring Capital and my personal Twitter. All right. Fantastic, guys. I'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well. And Stefan, that's all we have, my friend. Appreciate you coming on. It's been a lot of fun and uh, wishing you guys all the best here in the coming weeks, okay? Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. Take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.